Thanks for watching CBS 8 Plus and welcome to this throwback special. I'm Carlo Cicchetto. We've been covering San Diego for more than 70 years now and shared a lot of very special memories. In this throwback special, we're going back to high school, one of our favorite and most popular throwback subjects. No matter how much time has passed, it seems those four years live on in us. It's also just fun to see how San Diego high schools have changed throughout the years. Our archives date back to 1952, so we have a lot of old school film and video for you. First up, our oldest film and a little history lesson from our Marcella Lee. This is Will C. Crawford High in 1957, shortly before it opened in 1958. Check out those shiny lockers and imagine all of the students who would use them in the future. The school was named after Dr. Will C. Crawford, superintendent of the San Diego Unified Schools from 1934 to 1954. In 1967, more than 600 students graduated from San Diego High School, the oldest in the county. The commencement ceremony was held in Balboa Park Bowl. Also in 1967, up north, in the growing community of Poway, the school started using paraprofessionals to help teachers with clerical duties. Principal Dan Thompson said the volunteers were invaluable. Patrick Henry High School in San Carlos welcomed 1,800 students when it opened in 1968. It wasn't quite finished, though. Upon completion, it would cost more than $3.9 million. Home economics wasn't just for the girls at Patrick Henry. In 1972, male students learned how to iron and cook in the bachelor survival class. That cake looks delicious, doesn't it? That $3.9 million to build Patrick Henry works out to about $32 million today. That would be an absolute bargain for a new high school these days. As many of you know, uh, the movie Fast Times at Ridgemont High was based on writer and director Cameron Crowe's undercover year at Claremont High School here in San Diego. Don't believe me? Well, you could easily envision a Jeff Spicoli in the Gene Gleason story we have here from 1973 about a police raid over marijuana use near campus. If the police or anybody would have came out here and asked the people nicely if they, if they were hurting people's property and said, you know, just to leave, you know, we're not making any arrests, just just leave the property, go somewhere else to get stoned, you know, and then maybe the people would have done it. There's an informal debate raging at Claremont High School. Many students are upset and alarmed by a police raid November the 9th near the school that resulted in the arrest of 27 persons, most of them students, on drug charges. Students say the raid was unnecessarily rough and that it jeopardizes heretofore friendly relations the student body had with the police. The debate concerns whether to allow two police task force officers to remain on campus. San Diego police officers involved in the raid say it was in reaction to numerous complaints from nearby neighbors about blatant marijuana smoking near the campus and malicious vandalism. Students continue to maintain, however, that the raid caused more problems than it solved. When you smoke by yourself, you know, it's only to your, uh, only person you can harm is to yourself. But uh, trying to stop it like the police did is just the wrong way of doing things right there. Marijuana smoking can't be very conducive to education, however, can it? And most of the smoking is going on before class. Uh, yeah, well, uh, that could be a personal opinion there. I can't comment on that. <laughs> Meanwhile, students, most of whom are too young to vote, are circulating petitions calling for the decriminalization of marijuana. I'm Gene Gleason, TV8 Action News at Claremont High School. I think one of those kids grew up to be the dude in the Big Lebowski, but I digress. The first day of school is always one of the most intimidating and exhilarating days in a high schooler's life. New clothes, new classes, new friends. Now make that a little more interesting by making it everyone's first day on a brand new campus where in many cases construction isn't even complete. Here's a look at high schools that opened doors in a growing San Diego in the 1980s and 90s. It had been on the drawing boards for 17 years, but it wasn't until November of 74 that voters okayed a bond issue to build University City High School under Proposition XX. Opponents sought an injunction to halt construction as part of the integration case, arguing it would be an all-white school. But Judge Welsh ruled, build it. More than $17 million later, University City High welcomes more than 700 students, many coming from Claremont High, others from La Jolla and Madison, just the 10th and 11th grades this year. We would have unique problems like bus drivers not being sure where to unload the students, even though they did a practice drill on that on Saturday. 
so there are unique small problems where's the cafeteria which line do i get in one of the food items that are going to be so these are the things that students who go to a school know automatically in a new school as you said earlier today everything's new for everybody so there's a certain amount of camaraderie that's built in to coming into a new place like by saying yes we're all lost and yes it's new for all of us that's true Teachers and staff wore blue shirts so students would know whom to ask the where's and how's associated with the first day. Another group of students had a different kind of first class, those not properly immunized against measles. I have no choice. The law says I may not admit you. Along with predictable confusion, an accident. A mother looked back at her daughter and wound up down an embankment. No one was hurt. Please move into your first class. Have your program go to your first period. Thank you. University City High is no longer just a building. It is a school, complete with students, spirit, and problems, just like any other school. This is their new home, Rancho Bernardo High. Besides being a hall for learning, it also is a construction site. We're kind of behind because of the rain. It took 75 acres and $37 million to build a state-of-the-art school. Classrooms have high ceilings and lots of windows. It's clean, it's neat, it's mine, nobody else is used. It's like moving into your new house. Even the locker area has skylights in them, and you can tell this is a brand new school because none of the lockers have been kicked in yet. 1,400 students are enrolled here, and already school pride has set in. There's a lot of dirt and there's a lot of mud and stuff, and some of the, most of the area is like fenced off, but you know, it's better than what we had before, so I like it. The teacher spent about 15 minutes this morning explaining to them about off-limits area, where they could go, why they couldn't get on the grass right now because they just laid the sod, and they have been absolutely wonderful. The school is draped in blue, silvers, and whites, which are the colors for the RB Broncos. And they're certain other schools are green with envy. Keep the cars moving. Dean of Students Barry Owen was dressed for the occasion, which in the first couple of hours was more traffic control than anything else. We've yet to receive our buses. As soon as the buses come, that'll be our real test. The kids came by car and by foot and by bus. Good. You're our very first students off the bus. Congratulations, you're making history. <laughs> go right on in into the camp. Excuse me. Go right on into the campus area. 1,320 of them to day one of Scripps Ranch High School. I like it because it's going to be a new environment for all the seniors, I think. I think it'll be a nice experience for me. Oh, yeah. Thanks, a beautiful school, Tim. <laughs> it's a good idea. I'd like to have a new school come out. So. So I think it'll be fun. Scripps Ranch High School, two years in the making. The first high school built in this school district in 12 years is still in the final stages of finishing touches. A lot of activity has taken place to get the school open, and this is one of the spots that are not quite completed. That spot, the all-important school bell, which was having its own first day jitters. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> first bell in first year. First bell. <laughs> Which couldn't be heard outside the classrooms. Go up to students, ask them to go to, go to class. Use your locator cards <laughs> to find your first class. It's period one. The bell is rung. Let's go. If you need any assistance, ask. Look. Help me out, Coach Hill. 447. Oh, yeah. Football field, straight down here to the left in the stadium. Oh, 426. Okay, this yeah. is a 400 building. You want to go? It's down below. It's down below. <gasps> oh, EABM, our guy, he's safe. Great job. <laughs> they have the classic high school courses here, but they're also pioneering with a college like system where kids will choose one of four career paths or majors to better prepare them for the work world they'll face. We'll be studying about what makes an airplane fly, how they fly. <coughs> we'll be using a wind tunnel to test uh, lift, angle of attack on a wing. But back to basics. How's the new school's new football team looking? Our team coming along great. I mean, we, we figured we wasn't going to be that good this year, but we, we're better than we thought. Still no place to play that football, though. The fields aren't ready, neither is the gym. What is, however, is Scripps Ranch High School's school spirit. Okay. What's up, dude? All right. You guys know where to go? Lorraine Kimmel, News 8 Scripps Ranch. Okay, the saying goes, you can never go home again, but you can go back to high school, especially if you're a TV news reporter working in the city you grew up in. 
In 1978, CBS 8's Carol Hendrick went back to her alma mater, Crawford High School, and got a feel for a new generation of students. The 1970s, according to at least one teacher she talked to, were a little quieter on campus than the 60s. One campus that wasn't quiet at all was Valhalla, with its under one roof concept and design. Our John Kalia visited in 1981 when the school was going through some big changes. And when it comes to change, everything changed at Lincoln. Our Lena Nozizwe was there when it converted from a magnet school to a prep school in 1986. It hasn't really been that long since my high school days. Long enough so that the students I meet definitely let me know I'm on the other side of the hill, but short enough so that the teachers I meet refuse to acknowledge that any time has passed at all. But things have changed, and it's hard to put a finger on exactly how they've changed. I think it was easier back in the 50s and 60s when um, people were more united toward common causes, and the spirit was a lot higher. But Today we've got a new type of spirit, and that spirit is more to be yourself and uh, do your own thing. And we see it on Crawford um, all the time. People are always doing their own type of thing. And um, I think it really adds new colors, and um, a new type of spirits come out now. High school is much more than a place where students take classes that will get them diplomas and admissions to the college of their choice. It's a place where young people mature, grow up, get ready for the world, a place that stays in your memories for good or bad. When I was a student at Crawford High, the war in Vietnam and the abolition of the dress code were the big issues. The football team only won two games in three years, and leaving campus at lunchtime won you three days suspension. Teachers who survived the 60s on campus say it's a lot quieter now. Kids now are, are a lot a lot more mellow, so they say. I mean, uh, we don't have the anti-establishment that we had back in the 70s when I first came here. Kids are pretty loose, relaxed. Um, there doesn't seem to be quite the stress for grades as, as we had then. There seemed to be more competition for grades in those days. Um, these are the big things. We have. Um, we don't have as good of attendance as we did. More truancy. But uh, I'd, I'd say that overall, uh, the kids are a lot more relaxed and easygoing. Obviously, you check the dress codes. You can see what's happening in the dress code. It's pretty neat. It's like a fashion show. You can walk down the halls, and some people get really dressed up all the time. Like, we do have a best-dressed standout. But some, most people come casual and just the way they want. So it's really neat. OK, now into brick, and ain't going to hurt nobody. The biggest change on campus, it seems, is choice. Academically, there are independent study sessions, self-directed curricula, interdisciplinary programs, and multicultural activities. The students are better, and <laughs> I don't mean that anything against you, Carol, because you are a graduate. No, we really have neat students, and I think the uh, whole atmosphere of the school is uh, really so much improved as far as meeting the needs of the individual student. Sexual freedom that was guaranteed to cause gossip from lockers to slumber parties 10 years ago is taken for granted today. And to the relief of parents, teachers, and school security personnel, drug use seems to be declining. No, we're not. People are going toward natural highs now. And, um, <laughs> is that true? <laughs> that's true. And, uh, we, well, we're into things like, you know, like the beach and uh, having good times, girls and things like that. So um, I think they're a lot healthier and I think more, more satisfied. And um, people are turning on to other people. And um, I think it's, the, the world's getting a little bit better. The pressures on youth may always be the same. Inside, outside, change is a part of growing up. And maybe every era thinks they've cornered the market on the perils of youth. But it does seem there's an optimism on campus that wasn't there not so many years. A spirit that conveys the feeling that today's high school students don't see growing up in this world as such a traumatic experience after all. In appearance, a space station on Earth. In reality, home for nearly 2,000 high school students. Modern design, yes, but old-fashioned student humor lives on. Call the school and you'll be told. This is a student hotline for the week of September 28th to October 2nd, or days 11 through 15 of captivity. When Valhalla opened at a cost of $8 million in 1973, it was the first new school built in the district in 10 years. 
Ground had been broken in an atmosphere of blissful ignorance. At that time, there were no uh, kind of bounds on the energy that was available for things in those days. This school capitalized on that same philosophy, has central systems, was designed to be efficient in the fact that the systems were central and con concentrated in a four-level school. Having a school under one roof is an energy disaster. Air conditioning or heat must be on all the time. To light one desk, entire sections must be illuminated. There are plans now to change the building to take advantage of fresh air and more efficient lighting. But Sidney Gerstler, now in his fourth year as principal, says good teachers are always more important than a building's design. At Valhalla, with its openness, has come the need for patience and more. The traditional teacher who's accustomed to four walls and a door is in many ways uncomfortable. Um, that has been uh, one of the reasons we slowly have glassed in some areas because the noise has made it impossible for some people to operate. In the early years, many of the classes were held in this area. Openness was idealism, but idealism would soon be tempered with realism. It was found to be much more effective to have the classes contained. And so today, you have this. I think I'm a, a more open teacher now. I tend to be more receptive to my students. I tend to respect them more as individuals. I think the whole tone of the school is one that uh, lends itself toward uh, uh, humanitarian considerations, but also academic standards. Talk to the students, and it's apparent the changes are for the better. It gives you quite a bit of freedom when you, you have an open school like this, you know. And a lot of kids, you know, you can ditch or you can go to class. It's almost like college, you know. You have a way of getting out of it, but sometimes you get in trouble. What about the, uh, the difficulties in concentration and concentrating here with the noise factor that you've got? No problem at all. Everybody's pretty quiet when they have to be studying. It's fun, except for like on the stairs and everything. It takes you about five minutes to get up because there's lots of people. But it's, it's super fun and I like it a lot. Valhalla is not without serious problems. Drug abuse is a constant concern. Alcohol is the most widely used. Other concerns include the escalating prices of homes near the school. Most young families can't afford to live here. But for now, Valhalla seems to be a circle of optimism, a school in the round with administrators, teachers, and students not only surviving, but thriving. I'm Dr. Reed. Hi. Magnet coordinator here. Yeah. The special room. greeter is Ramon Reed, the magnet coordinator for Lincoln High School. Sure, they should be afraid of coming to a prep school because they don't know what's going on, but a lot of good things are going to go on, and as they come here and get to meet the teachers, then they'll know what, what's happening. If you're wondering how Lincoln High School spent its summer vacation, well, it turned into a prep school, a magnet program with a focus on health care professions and an emphasis on humanities. There are going to be a lot of new things at, at the school. Lincoln Prep School is uh, going to be very, very special this year. Teacher Eleanor Frank is only part of the new look. She's one of 20 new teachers at the school to go along with $85,000 worth of new books and research materials and all new window panes. It's all part of the prep school image. And when we talk about a prep school, we're not talking about a place that has ivy growing up the sides of the walls or where students wear little alligators on their t-shirts. We're talking about a place where there's a three-year requirement for math, languages, and science. I see that we're changing from a magnet school that was just a euphemism to a magnet school that where the metaphor really means that we're going to attract black kids to Lincoln High School where we know we can get a quality education here at home. It's just different. It's funner now, too. It's better. I went to the orientation. It sounds like it's going to be fun. But you're going to have to work. Got to learn. And school administrators hope that more students will feel that way, and not just on the first day of school, but the last. Leonard Ozee's Way, News 8, Southeast San Diego. For some, graduation is the best day of high school, but for others, it can be the worst. Saying goodbye to friends and soon saying hello to bigger responsibilities with just the turn of a tassel. In 1978, Judy Elfenbein talked to some remarkably clear-eyed new graduates at Claremont High School. CBS 8's Liz Purcell visited Patrick Henry as the class of 1980 was getting ready to walk out, a vast majority ready to walk right on to a college campus. And in 1987, 
I was graduating high school and Artie Ojeda already had his mustache and a job at CBS 8. He listened to pomp and circumstance at Mission Bay High School and found out that it may have been a bigger day for parents than their kids. And in 1991, Hoover High graduates were eager to jump into the future and felt more education was the key. Or at least that's what they told our MG Perez. It's diploma time of the year again. These are Claremont High School seniors doing what comes naturally. As you can see, formal attire beneath gowns is no longer traditional. But tears, hugs, and proud parents still are. All in all, San Diego will hand out 7,819 diplomas at this and 18 other graduation exercises. What makes the class of 78 different? Well, they are the last to go through school without Jarvis Gann. And they didn't have to take competency tests. We asked them what they think people will remember. The drama department! Yeah! We're the wild and crazy intellectuals. <laughs> Fires on the flagpole and putting Claremont High School up for sale by Jarvis Realty. And now for the moment these seniors have been waiting 12 years for. Have fun getting there. Seniors! Most San Diego seniors are graduating tomorrow. Here at Patrick Henry High School, students are practicing for those ceremonies. One more day of the security of high school, then these kids are on their own. It may be, however, they're not really on their own. Apparently, just like other years, the majority of graduates are headed for another few years of school. Well, next year I'm going to Stanford University, where I don't know what I'll be majoring in yet, but that's where I'm going. I'm going to be working a lot and uh, making a lot of money. And I think I might go up and be a logger up in uh, Washington for a while. Are most of your friends going to school? Well, a lot of them want to just work for a year and then go on to school. But a lot of them, work, it's about half and half, really. Because if I don't go to school, my mom will make me pay room and board. So I'm going to go to school for a while. Those plans reflect the outcome of a survey conducted by the school district. In the survey, seniors were asked about their future. 75% of the students are planning on some kind of additional education after high school graduation, either for two-year college or trade or business school. A few years back, the school district decided to follow the progress of the class of 72, keeping tabs on members for four years. 62% of those seniors went on to college. And as we looked at our students two years after graduation, we found that 55 percent were still in school, where the national level had dropped down to 40 percent. The class of 80 may be graduating, but certainly won't be forgotten. John Griffith will be following its members, too, to find out what happens to them over the next four years. It's doubtful very many students even know the name of that song, but they know what it means. Graduation Day, 1987. At most city schools this afternoon, there was pomp, there was circumstance. But before that, there was nervousness. And I'm very excited. I worked hard on my on these years, and this kind of sums it all up in this graduation ceremony. On this day, there were no tough math problems. Maybe the toughest problem of all was trying to put on your gown. But this was all pre-graduation when the group was made up of mere high school students. A short time later on the football field, they crossed the 50-yard line and stepped into a new world. All that's left now is the future. Now, anybody who's ever been to a graduation ceremony knows this is a big day for the students. But any parent who's been to one of these things knows it's an even bigger day for them. Uh, yeah, it has been, especially for my wife, who's been preparing for a big party afterwards, and she's been at it for two days straight, and today I just ran around like a chicken with my head cut off getting Aww. things done. And even if mom and dad had to struggle for attention, it didn't matter. They're proud, and this is a moment they'll remember forever. RDO Hatem News 8 at Mission Bay High School. Graduation day at Hoover High School. The end of four years of hard work and the beginning of something else. For some of the 340 graduates, it's time off, or maybe time to start a job. But many plan to start college soon. They wouldn't have it any other way. Because what everyone's doing it, you know, in order to get a good job, you have to have a good education. And that's why. To be successful in life, you gotta be, you gotta continue your education. The further you go with your education, the further you go in life. That's where I see it. I feel that nowadays, without a college degree, I don't think you can survive out there. Tiffany Algorin. 
In the next week and a half, about 19,630 seniors will graduate San Diego County High Schools. Statistics show 57% of them will enroll in a college or university. Administrators are confident they'll be ready. For a high school student, certainly it's not the end, and we expect that they're going to be going on and they're going to continue their education, and we hope we've given them that hope to be lifelong learners. High school graduation day marks the end of an era that many look back on with deep nostalgia. Good thing for them, there are reunions. In 1978, Doug McAllister met Claremont High School students from the class of 1968 planning their 10th reunion. San Diego High School's class of 1928 were happy to see each other at their 60th, yes, 60th reunion. And in 1991, Gina Liu was there as the class of 1941 reminisced about their high school years half a century later. The year was 1968. Vietnam was raging, Tet, the bombings, the peace talks. Anti-war protest was widespread, so was anti-protest sentiment. The Reverend Martin Luther King and Senator Robert Kennedy fell to assassins bullets. The world was seeing changes like never before. At home, Camelot appeared ready to fall apart. And there were big questions about how all of this was affecting the American young. Across the country, hundreds of thousands of high school seniors left the confines of their homes and schools for the confused outside world. Where are they today and how were they affected by those times and times since? Well, to say little or not at all would be off base. To say that the times had their effect and that most were able to adjust would be closer to what really happened to the class of 68. In June of that year, Claremont High School graduated nearly 600 seniors. It was an average American graduating class of the time, according to some of those who were in it, with an average American four years of high school behind it. Athletics, school functions, and involvement were big, and college after high school was still considered to be the best way to become a success. The politics, drugs, and individualism of classes to follow hadn't yet filtered down from the colleges, though change was on its way. I think 1968, 1969, and the early 70s were really a big decision time. In other words, uh, like I said, you had to worry about the draft, and the draft played a big part in a lot of people's lives. And I think, uh, you know, by the time everything was over and you didn't have to worry about that anymore, uh, people then could decide what they wanted to do. And when they did make that decision, it was so much different from what they had decided in high school and shortly after high school. Pulley left CHS for the drama department of Mesa College. From there, he went to San Diego State, took a degree in accounting, and then became a fireman. Sue Crownover Ferraro was CHS 68 senior class vice president and today is an assistant bank manager. For Sue, high school then was what it should have been. Yes, uh, I feel that um, there's plenty of time when you get out of high school and into college or whatever endeavor you're going to be in to grow up and be serious and worry about the problems of the world. But in high school, sure, worry about your grades and all. But the social part, I think, was really building your character and getting you involved with people. And I really enjoyed high school very much. While Claremont High was fun, spirits high, for some, life after high school was a bit more difficult than life inside it. Charlene Calugar, a state scholarship semifinalist, works for the city of San Diego. She started UCSD as a French major, graduated UC Irvine in social sciences, has worked as an airline stewardess, a teacher, and at many other jobs. I don't know if it was because of Claremont or my background, but I don't think I had a real feeling for the fact that you have to plan your life and have some goals. I just thought that, you know, I was told a thousand times, if you go to college, you'll make ten times more money than the people who don't. And by the time I got out of college, I found that really wasn't true. Some say Claremont High 78 is a vastly different place than it was ten years ago. Less school spirit and pride, a bit more trouble, much less togetherness. There was trouble with drugs a few years ago, but according to one recent graduate, that happened during more frivolous times. Now, says the graduate, people are taking school more seriously, with an understanding that a good secondary education can mean a good start on life after high school, which comes on quickly and seriously. The Claremont High class of 68 is holding a 10-year reunion July 29th at the Catamaran. This committee has been working more than a year organizing it, and they say they've contacted three-quarters of their classmates, 
most of whom still live in the San Diego area. In a short while, the class of 68 will be together again to reminisce and get reacquainted. Though time has passed quickly, hopefully it has passed graciously. And those who, after a decade, are reunited will share the philosophy of Claremont's class of 68 newspaper editor. We look at, through the yearbook and we say, was that really me? And it's like, sure, that was me. Just minus a few curly locks here or a few more gray hairs here and there. But it's been a good 10 years. It wasn't just a reunion, but a time to rejoice that so many members of San Diego High School's class of 28 are still around. I'm surprised uh, that there's such a good crowd here. I think that's great because, you know, we all have to be at least 78 years old to be here. Well, we do change. We have changed a little. You haven't changed much. Were the guys who were cute in high school still cute now? Oh, there's one that is. <laughs> Guys couldn't help but look cute back then, wearing bell-bottoms like this. They say you used to take two steps before the pants moved. And this was the uniform for the young ladies. If you didn't wear this, you went to the office and you got a demerit. And if you had too many demerits, um, your parents were notified. And then there was a session in the office as to why you were out of uniform. The class of 28 used to call San Diego High School the Old Gray Castle. It's kind of hard to picture with all this modern architecture, but of course a lot of things have changed since then, and I'm not just talking about the buildings. It's sometimes uh, uh, a little frightening to understand. But they've all had to adapt one way or another as they enter their 80s in the 1980s. Different and better? Not necessarily. We had a lot of fun in those days. When it was these way, News 8, Harbor Island. The San Diego High School Class of 1941. San Diego, along with the rest of the country, was in the mood for change. These faces represent the optimism and innocence that they thought lay ahead. They were the last class to graduate in Balboa Park's Oregon Pavilion. It was a wonderful time. The fear and the threat of the Depression was fading. Way in the distance, we had read and heard about what was going on in Europe but it hadn't touched our lives. Catherine Condon was senior class president. Well, it was a, a happy time when people were beginning to feel like they could do something again, besides go to Goodwill and buy their kids pajamas and shoes and socks. And that happened. It happened to me. Full of promise, many graduates headed for college, but their education and life as they knew it ended abruptly on December 7th. The Second World War had the most dramatic effect on me of anything that's ever happened in my life. Tom Warburton had been a high school letterman, a typical teenager, ready for the good times. You know, I was 18 years old, and I just, uh, I'd had uh, about nine months in college, and I was called up. Uh, it was expected of you that you were going to serve. You knew it. And uh, unfortunately, when it first started out, it looked very glamorous. When it ended up, it was anything but glamorous. The war had a tremendous impact on San Diego. I mean, we went from a little village, practically, to a, to a major city. Marion Jepson was class vice president. Well, San Diego was quite an exciting place in those days when the war started. So I'm sure some innocence that was robbed somewhere. Uh, it was, it filled immediately uh, with ships and sailors and we even had army here. Ikuku Kuratomi was number one scholastically in her class and president of the Girls Athletic Association. Her parents ran a shoe store downtown. On December 7th, everything changed. They were about to go to church, and then I guess the uh, FBI men came and said uh, uh, possibly that they wanted to question him. So when uh, they took my father, he told my mother that 
he would be back in a little while. But he never did come back. Ikuko abruptly left UC Berkeley to run the family business. She, her mother, and sister were relocated to one camp. Her father had been interned at another. It would be years before the family would be reunited. I would feel quite resentful that uh, my parents were uh, put away like that. I know that uh, they would not have done anything to jeopardize this country's safety. Following the war, most picked up where they had left off. Ikuko became a medical technician. Marion and Tom became educators and married. And ironically, Catherine's job took her back to her alma mater as school librarian. For the class of 1941, it's time to come home. It's like life has come a full circle. 50 years is a lifetime. And it's a way for me to say hello again and goodbye really to a lot of us. A lot of us are not feeling well and we won't be around that much longer. So it's very important. Thank you so much for watching this throwback special. I hope you enjoyed it. To see more throwbacks like this one on CBS 8 Plus, click on the news tab at the top of the screen. I'm Carla Cicchetto. We'll see you next time.